Hello to everyone out at eISECAM watching this video and this lecture. My name is Paul Wishmeyer, and I'm a professor of anesthesiology and surgery at Duke University. And I'm here to hopefully impress upon all of you that we need to improve our post-ICU rehabilitation and talk about ways perhaps we can do that. These are my brief disclosures or perhaps alignments of interest. And I think the key message I want to convey today is we need to take responsibility not just for our outcomes in the ICU, but what's happening to our patients afterwards as well, with the ultimate goal that we create survivors of our patients and not victims, victims that perhaps never go back to the families that they love, walking down the street with the people they love and perhaps holding their grandchildren again, which is ultimately our goal. And so the question I encourage all of you to ask every day on rounds is, is the care I'm giving the patient today creating survivors of my patients, survivors that go back to a life that's meaningful, or is it also perhaps contributing to them becoming victims and not going back to the life that they want? And I think the best way to think about the lives and what our patients think about their lives after ICU is to hear from a patient them themselves. And so I want you to listen to a patient of Wes Ely's, name you'll know, uh, who he was kind enough to introduce me to. Her name is Melissa, and she's going to compare a few weeks in the ICU with ARDS to having many years of cancer. And I want you to listen closely to her words. I never dreamed after having had leukemia and done two years with it and chemo and all that, and um, I, I never dreamed that anything else could be worse. And this was so much worse. It was more spiritually, emotionally, physically, um, intellectually challenging than, 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 I mean, than even cancer. If, if you presented me with arts and cancer, leukemia, I would choose the leukemia. So again, there's a, there's a great resource, and I think it really speaks to what our patients are experiencing. And, and now I want to tell you about another patient, Elijah, who, um, a good friend of many of ours, Mervyn Singer, had reached out to me a short time ago, and he was a gentleman who competed in ski marathons. He was an outstanding athlete and very fit, and he completed multiple ski marathons in the last year. And then a year or two ago, he was developed with community-acquired pneumonia, and he ended up requiring um, mechanical ventilation for just one day, and he was in the hospital for about 10 days, but in the ICU for just a day and a half. And he loses about five kilos and is discharged from the hospital. He let me know that three months later, following hospital discharge, he couldn't even climb up the escalators in the London Underground subways without being exhausted. He had been working out at this point almost nine months with a trainer in the gym with no progress in endurance at all. He wasn't making any progress with the things that, that he thought would help him. And he said leaving the ICU was a bit like going off of a cliff, jumping off of a cliff in terms of support and guidance that he received to help him recover. We need to be better than that. And again, no one is immune to this. Young and old all suffer this ICU-acquired weakness. And I fear the COVID-19 pandemic will make things worse as it leads to prolonged post-ICU and even post-hospital dysfunction. So we need to be better than this in our ICU rehab, but how? Again, I think it's going to take a combination of personalized nutrition, rehabilitation, and our outstanding physical therapists, and then some learnings we can learn from elite athletes, perhaps to make this better. Because the reality is recovering from the ICU is the marathon of our patients' lives. And this gentleman is the oldest man to run a marathon. And perhaps if you turned him on his side and put an IV in him, he'd look like an ICU patient. But the reality is even our very elderly patients are, a bit, are able to achieve very good qualities of life if we help them. And are there things we can learn from elite athletes to help our patients train and exercise smart, eat well, and recover better? And these are all the things an elite athlete would do especially say an Olympic athlete, to optimize their training with exercise, nutrition, and all of the guidance and measurements. And we'll talk about some of these things. The key thing is one size does not fit all patients at all times. And we need to be very personalized in our rehab, targeting exercise and nutrition in the right dose, in the right patient, at the right time. And we need to have measurements of individual patients' needs. And so how would a patient engage in nutrition, say if they were a recovering ICU patient? What would an elite athlete tell you? Well, first they tell you, of course, you can't build a house without bricks and protein is essential. You can't build muscle without protein. And so again, we know that as patients age, and many of our patients are older, they become anabolic resistant, which means it takes more grams of protein to make the same amount of muscle as we age than it did when we were young. 
Now, not all older patients have muscle mass loss. This is a gentleman who is age 70, that's quite a bit of muscle. Again, it took more than eating right to do that, but I think there's a lot that could be learned. Athletes take in boluses of protein, significant boluses of protein, and they take in branching amino acids and protein before they go to bed. And I think these are all things we can learn. And again, they engage in strength training, but this bolus is an interesting idea that's getting studied now. And again, critical illness contributes to this more severely. The anabolic resistance of critical illness is even more severe. So nutrition and exercise alone are not likely to do it. And we're gonna need other interventions, HMB, oxandrolone, and propranolol, to improve the outcomes of our patients beyond exercise and nutrition. The other reality is patients are not going to eat enough on their own. In fact, athletes can't eat enough on their own without supplementing either. The average patient takes in about 700 calories per day, which is nowhere near what they need to recover. Now, if you ask any athlete, all of us, all of the athletes will tell you they live on protein shakes. And again, for our patients, high protein or nutrition supplements are the only way to de deliver their post ICU needs. So, this is one excellent study of post ICU high protein and HMB combinations showing that when given for three months after discharge, you can have the mortality in patients following an ICU stay. And so, I think this is very potent data in a large randomized trial that shows the benefit of giving these protein shakes to our patients. So can we do better to assess sarcopenia and malnutrition? Or can we monitor this better and do we have new tools learned from Tour de France athletes to help us? And one is the use of an innovative muscle ultrasound. And this is that ultrasound being used on a Tour de France rider just after the race. It's called the muscle sound ultrasound and it, it can give us in a moment images that tell us all about the muscle. It's an ultrasound probe about this big, plugs into your iPad or iPhone and it can give you muscle glycogen, muscle mass, and muscle energy states and muscle quality in minutes in our hands. And so again, this is a key new tool we need to be using that athletes use. But the question is, is the right nutrition enough to win the war? Again, if we don't feed our patients, they're going to lose massive amounts of muscle and have muscle dysfunction. But even with adequate feeding, they're gonna to continue to lose muscle because of the severe catabolism and hypermetabolism that our patients suffer. And this can persist for months to years after their discharge. And are the things we can learn from athletes that involve doing more than eating right, because you have to do more than eat right to look like this gentleman, to help our patients, and some is taking the right anabolic agents. Again, anabolic agents like testosterone should not be used early in ICU, but later in care, they may be essential. I've checked many patients' testosterone levels, and almost all are severely deficient within three to five days in the ICU. So that even if you feed and exercise these patients without any anabolic signal, they're not likely to gain weight. This is common practice to give oxandrolone and testosterone or burnings around the world, whether in the US or South Africa or India, everyone gets oxandrolone. And it seems to reduce mortality and improve many outcomes, strength, function, time to healing, all these outcomes are improved by oxandrolone. And this is a worldwide standard of care, but it's not spread to other ICUs. Because there's been concern about its safety, does it increase cardiovascular risk or clotting risk? Well, the answer is no. When patients are deficient, there's now a 43,000 subject study in males that have low testosterone levels that show that when the testosterone is given back, they have 30% reductions in stroke, heart attacks, and all-cause cardiovascular events. It's protective to the cardiovascular system and against stroke. So again, it's very safe. So this is something you can check. It's a very inexpensive test. It comes back in a day. Don't check the free, only check the total. The data that's been published shows that 94% of patients are severely deficient by day three. These are the doses that are recommended. Doxandrolone is purely anabolic, does not virilize. So it can be given to men and women. Testosterone cypionate also can be used. 200 milligrams IMQ two weeks. It's an IM shot. It's very inexpensive. You've got to feed adequately. We published a paper just two weeks ago on this subject. If you want to learn more about it, it's got some great tables and recommendations in it. It's in current opinion critical care this month. But I think the summary of what we need to think about is, look, all of these things, bed rest, inflammation, reduced testosterone and malnutrition lead to catabolism and physical dysfunction. It's going to take attacking all three pillars of recovery, I think, to optimize care. And again, this is a figure from that paper. So finally, exercise. If patients are going to exercise, they need to do it like an athlete would. This is not your average training. So can we learn from athletes to exercise smarter? This is not about riding a stationary bike without guidance. This is this kind of targeted training that our patients need, HIT training by CPET testing. And this personalized HIT exercise training is the future and we're doing it now. And so this is a reality. Exercise physiology testing gives us lots of information to allow us to personalize the care of the patient and teach them how to do their exercise and their HIT training. 
Why do we do this? I want to tell you about another patient, Joshua. He was a burn patient at another hospital I worked at. He had a 37% burn. He was pretty athletic before that. He was hospitalized only 24 days. He went back home and tried to go back to riding his bike. He couldn't get up the hill outside his house for months afterwards without being fatigued and completely exhausted. He'd have to walk his bike. So we brought him in and we tested him. What does this testing tell us? Well, it tells us what substrates are being used in the muscle. Fatty acids are only used in the mitochondria, and glucose, of course, can be used in the cytoplasm. It tells us about their mitochondrial function and why they're not having endurance. This is what a world-class athlete looks like. They can use fat up to very high workloads. They're very efficient, and they have a very high mitochondrial density. These are what their CPET tests look like. This is what an obese diabetic patient looks like. They can't do much exercise before they have to convert to all glycogen. They have very poor fat utilization and very poor mitochondrial function. So again, what about our patient? Well, he could use no fat. You can see the red line there at the bottom showed that at any workload, he could only oxidize carbohydrates. So once his glycogen stores were used up, he had no endurance left. And many of our patients probably suffer this. So you could see no fat oxidation at all. And we tested him on multiple occasions showing this. The person I work with, Enigo Sambalana, tested thousands of people and never ever seen this before, but he'd never tested an ICU patient. So he had no mitochondrial function in this setting, in his muscle. So we put him on a specific mitochondrial rehab high intensity training exercise program and nutrition program. And months later, his fat oxidation returned. His mitochondria became more efficient. And so again, this is likely common in our patients, this mitochondrial dysfunction. He's now a competitive cyclist competing in long bike races. But how many of our patients without this kind of targeted training will ever get their recovery to progress? And again, many of them will never be able to walk the way they want again, much less ride a bike. So does this personalized exercise and nutrition work? Again, this is another patient we've cared for in a study for preoperative optimization. This was a woman who was on oxygen that had been turned down for surgery at many institutions. And so we did our HIT training with her. We did a high protein oral nutrition supplement with HMB on her training days. We targeted her training and we were able to significantly increase her lean body mass, significantly decrease her fat mass. You can see we added two kilos of lean body mass in just a month. And we increased her exercise tolerance by an entire over a met, a measure of exercise tolerance. That's a massive improvement. If she was able to maintain that for her life, she'd reduce her lifetime mortality risk, much less her ability to have surgery. She went and had surgery, was out of the ICU in a day, and was home in a week. And she's continuing to exercise now. So again, this is a reality. The future for this is now. We're doing studies and planning studies with Vanderbilt and West Ely to do this in ICU patients, post-COVID and post-ICU. And our hope is, that through this study called REMHIT ICU, we can do this in people's homes using an iPhone and an iWatch with data that we have at the beginning. And again, we've been able to do this in cancer patients, debilitated cancer patients, and improve their adherence and compliance significantly. And we can improve their VO2 25% with this home exercise program. And so this is what our planned project will look like, and we hope to be able to do this soon. This is research that we've done that will hopefully give us some answers across the board. This is papers you can look at. So as, as I close, why am I confident that we can do better and why do I hope you care as much as I do? So again, all of us at some point will be in the ICU, Derek Angus has taught us. We all will average 1.7 emissions over our lifetime. So someday this will be you or someone you care about. And then unfortunately my past, it has been me. I've used up a number of your ICU stays. This was me at age 15. I've been in the ICU many times. I've had 23 abdominal surgeries, many ICU stays, and I'm now short gut with an ostomy. And this was me, probably in the best shape of my life a number of years ago with my son. But unfortunately, I ate some quinoa a few days later, never eat quinoa, and got a bowel obstruction. And that bowel obstruction led me to show up in my own emergency room with a rising lactate and severe um, peritonitis. I went to the operating room where I spent eight hours in the operating room and then ended up my own ICU with an open abdomen for fear of bowel ischemia was in the hospital for 23 days and went from looking like this to looking like this into 17 days on TPN. Couldn't walk down the street without being short of breath within two weeks. Couldn't even pick up my own child five months later at Christmas. I was too weak. So what does recovery and prehabilitation look like to me? It's a part of my everyday life. It takes four to 5,000 calories a day and two grams per kilo per day of protein for me, for me to have recovered from that. And this is me with my ostomy. I like to show people with ostomies that their lives are not over. They can do anything they could do before because many of my ostomy patients don't have much hope. This was me surfing right after surfing. So you can do anything with an ostomy you could do before. These are all the things I take to help me recover from ICU and prepare perhaps for the future. 
These are all things that we need to teach our patients to consider taking and exercise and nutrition is essential. How many of our patients will know what it takes? These are opportunities we have to do better and you're the people that can teach them. ICU recovery begins the day of ICU admission and to guide our patients in the marathon of life, we have to be better because we never wanna hear this. From if you presented me with ARDS and cancer, leukemia, I would choose the leukemia. So hopefully we can learn from people like this and people like this to do things like this, and I'm happy to send you this slide, and take people that are in the ICU, have them walking, perhaps exercising in their beds. This is a new innovative weightlifting bed. You can see we do leg presses right in the bed, and then ultimately have them leave like this, or at least like this. And with that, I'll be happy to take your questions. Feel free to reach out to me, and I'll send you any papers on Twitter or Instagram or by email. Thank you so much, and let's do better.